I would like to pass things on to our scientific uh, advisor. And those of you who haven't met her, um, I, she's a great resource for our club. And when I tell you what she's been doing, you'll understand why. She's a mycologist and a plant pathologist at the US Department of Agriculture in the Animal and Plant Inspection Service, which is called APHIS. And every time I see it, I think of aphids. Um, she works in the mycology and nematology, genetic diversity and biology laboratory up in Beltsville, which is where Mitch works as well. Uh, she specializes in fungal identification on or in plants being brought into the United States from all over the world, as well as fungi in the United States. Um, going beyond the gross morphology that we use in the field, um, which is itself a list of 26 characteristics, her work depends on microscopic morph morphological examination and DNA sequence analysis. She's interested in both the evolutionary development of fungi and taxonomic classification. Um, <clears throat> classification shows up for us amateurs most, mostly as Latin binomials that seem to change with every new mushroom, mushroom season. Um, and the dense clade diagrams, um, they have so many lines that I might need a microscope to read them. Megan is interested in documenting fungi diversity and trains other people in morphological identification of fungi, which is definitely what we need in our club. And so um, when uh, she's at events, you should definitely talk to her. She helps demonstrate the use of the microscope at our mushroom fair and at some mall meetings, if we ever get back to holding those. And she can help you learn how to use it as well. We do have a nice microscope, which we haven't had an opportunity to use a lot since COVID happened. So, Megan, uh, go ahead. You're uh, ready to screen share, I think. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. All right. And we will get this started. And I have to change the display settings. All right. Do you see my first slide? Yes, looks good. Okay, great. Actually, go back. All right. So um, this is also a talk that I gave at Sequinota, and I added a little bit. Hopefully, I won't go over the time. Um, I think if you've been hiking in the woods in the mid-Atlantic, you'll see this plant, mountain laurel or calmia, and the spots on it are ubiquitous. Pretty much all calmia have these spots. I put up this picture because I was looking around for a nice pretty picture with the flowers and almost all of them had nice leaves without spots. And this was one of the very few that I found that actually represented what um, this plant looks like in real life. So like I said, usually you're out and you'll see these leaves of the calmia of the mountain laurel and they've got these beautiful concentric circles on them, little white spots inside. And it's a pretty distinct fungus. Um, it, it's not really a disease, and we'll talk a little bit about what it does, but it's on all of these mountain laurels. And um, you might want to make an iNaturalist observation. And so you have to choose a name. And these are the two names that are in iNaturalist. So you could either choose Mycosphorella colorata, or you could choose Pseudocercosper calmiae. And most of these microfungi have no common name. So other than mountain laurel leaf spot, there's nothing else you'd really call it. So which one should you choose? Um, and the answer is a little complicated. And the, the answer sort of is neither or both. So like I said, you can go in and you can choose Mycosphorella colorata. And there are lots of observations of that, 444. Or you could choose Pseudocercosper calmiae. And there are 11 observations of that. It's really the same fungus. And it should be called under one name. Since 2011, fungi um, can really only have one name. Previously, they were allowed to have at least two, sometimes three or more. So mountain laurel leaf spot is caused by an ascomycete. And um, those of you who are familiar with fungal classification will know that the ascomycota, the phylum ascomycota, and the vestidiomycota are two of the major groups of fungi. 
Um, the Basidio mycota contains the mushrooms, the jelly fungi, the brackets, and rusts and smuts. And I think Mitch is going to show a couple of rusts. And there are about 50,000 described species in the Basidio mycota. The Asco mycota has about 90,000 described species. So it's much bigger. There are a whole lot more Asco mycotes, but they're tiny. We know of a few of them in the morels, but most of them are yeasts, like bread yeast. Lichens involve ascomycetes in many cases. Uh, what people refer to as molds, the things growing on your citrus and bread and other um, items in your house, endophytes and parasitic microfungi. So these fungi hide. They're all over, but you need a microscope in most cases to see them. So this is a sample that came into my lab. Um, it's juniper leaves. This is a centimeter. This is the part that I mounted on the micro, under the microscope, and this is what I was able to see. So they're beautiful, but they um, hide themselves away, and only people who have access to pretty high-powered microscopes can see them. One of the main differences between ascomycetes and basidiomycetes is how they reproduce. So basidiomycetes is mushrooms that we're all familiar with, grow um, as threads, grows the mycelium, and in each of those cells, there are two nuclei. So they're dikaryotic. That forms the basidiocarp. Here on the basidia, you get the basidia that form. The two nuclei fuse, you have meiosis, and these spores, the basidiospores that are one in, get reproduce and spread out. So Mushrooms spend a lot of their time as dikaryotic mycelia, and then you get the sexual reproduction of basidia spores being produced off of basidia. Ascomycetes reproduce differently, and that name, ascomycota, comes from the term ascus, which really means wine sack. And if you look at this ascus of a powdery mildew, you can see why that connection was made. So in the ascomycota, you have a very, very small amount of time where that fungus might be dikaryotic. You have meiosis occurring sometimes, but most of the time the ascomycota spend their lives haploid, so just one in. You know, humans get half of our DNA from mom, half from dad, so we are two N all the time, except in our gametes, except in the sperm and the eggs. In the ascomycota, they spend a lot of time in the haploid state, so it's just one in. And a lot of ascomycota reproduce asexually. They're just forming copies of their cells. You do get some sexual reproduction, and that's what happens in the ascus, and there you'll get eight ascospores, sometimes more, sometimes fewer. And this reproduction of sometimes asexual and sometimes sexual has led to a wide diversity of what you actually see. Often out in the world, we mostly see the asexual part of a lot of fungi and you don't see the sexual state. So that led to mycologists naming fungi for either the asexual state or the sexual state, which they didn't see at the same time. So a lot of fungi got two different names. You can even have cases where two different asexual structures are formed, and you'll get three structures and three names for a fungus. So mountain laurel leaf spot is caused by an ascomycete. And if you look closely at these spots under the microscope, you'll see the two different spores that are produced, or there's two different ways and spores are produced. So there's the cercospirous spores, and cercospora, it's really pseudocercospora, they're false tailed spores. They're these long, thin spores that are produced asexually. And then you'll get these sexual forms, which are formed in little balls. And the name mycosphorella means really small fungus balls. Um, and in those little balls, it produces the assay with the ascospores inside. In mountain laurel leaf spot, you see both of these often, but that's, like I said, not, not true for a lot of ascomycetes. So each of these got a different name. This was Pseudocercospora, and this was Mycosphorella. And Mycosphorella particularly, it's a really complicated situation. So this is the sexual state. Mycosphorella forms in an ascus. You get these spores with one wall, a septum in between. 
And all of these different species and more produce sexual spores that look like this. So these are many different species. In fact, there are about 33 different species that use this as their reproductive strategy when they're reproducing sexually, but have a lot of different reproductive strategies when they're reproducing asexually. So as you can imagine, this led to a lot of confusion. Sometimes you would see this state, sometimes you would see this state, this had one name, this had one name, and then people came along and gave them different names anyway. So this is where DNA sequencing has really, really helped in the microfungi. It causes headaches for everybody, it changes names all the time, drives people crazy, but it's really helped us define who's related to whom and how they're related. And now we know that certain sexual states are related to certain asexual states that we never knew before. And this has come really quickly. So in 2001, uh, this group in the Netherlands did some sequencing of a gene region of mycosphorella and the asexual states, the anamorphs. And they came up with this tree where things were sort of falling out and you could kind of see here's a group here and here's a group here. Um, and that was the beginnings of us really figuring out where do these different asexual states, where do all of these different parts belong and who do they belong to in terms of sexual states. By 2009, it was a lot clearer, a lot more isolates had been sequenced. We had better um, technology for sequencing and this continues today. But now all of these different groups that would have had a sexual state named Mycosphorella and an asexual state named something else now only use the asexual state name. And actually the name Mycosphorella is a dead genus. Um, it's going to be retired when and if we actually have a true name for each of these groups and each of these asexual states. So that brings me back to the mountain laurel leaf spot. So we know that it forms a mycosphorella state because it looks like mycosphorella. We know that it forms a pseudocercospora state because it looks like pseudocercospora. So what name should we use? Well, prior to 2011, Fungi that presented two visually different states could have two names. DNA sequencing has clarified the connections and fungi may now only have one name. However, in order to do that, you have to prove the connection. So you need to either recollect the fungus from the original location or use a fungarium specimen if the original specimen was preserved and can be extracted from for its DNA. You sequence the representative isolates, you determine where in that tree they should be put, and then you can publish a new combination and, and go with what the name should be. There's a database with um, the um, Agricultural Research Services, uh, the US National Fungus Collections Database, and you can look up names there. And these are all various Mycosphorella names. A lot of them have been given new names. So if you look here at Mycosphorella citrogena, the new name for that is Passolora citrogena, and that's what we should be calling it. That's based on an asexual form, and that's the new name for that fungus. But a lot of these don't have a new name over here, and Mycosphorella colorata is one of them. It's a very old fungus. It's been known for a long time, and we see this happening a lot. Um, fungi that are all over, we know they're, they're super common, but people have not gone back to actually do the work to sequence um, isolates of this. Um, there's also a European and other parts of the world uh, bias. A lot of this work is not being done in the US. So you end up with um, these names here that are old names. We should not be using Mycosphorella, but we have no good new name to use. So there's a research project. If you're an undergraduate looking for an honors thesis, you could go out into the woods get this to grow, sequence it, and maybe publish a paper. And that's true of so many fungi. I mean, almost all fungi that you talk about, mushrooms, ascomycota, um, we have way more questions than we actually do answers. So there's a wide world of research questions that could be answered. So that's the fascinating nomenclatural issues that um, are occurring in the ascomycetes and in mountain laurel leaf spot in particular. Um, as I was 
making this uh, talk for the Sequinota group, um, I thought, well, people might want to actually have something else. I mean, I could spend all day on nomenclature. I think it's fascinating. You can go to the, um, the IAPT, the um, nomenclature website, read the guides to nomenclature since 1867. It's absolutely fascinating. Let me know if you want to do that. Um, but not everybody's really into that. So I wanted to see if anyone had looked into what is mountain laurel leaf spot doing in the environment. And there's also been very little uh, research on that. And so basically the only thing I came up with was in 1998, uh, these folks published a paper in ecology where they looked at what was infection of mountain laurel leaf spot of the um, probably pseudocercospora is what we should be calling it what was the effect of the infection of the fungus on that host? And what they found was that fungal infection on maternal plants was associated with an increased proportion of outcrossed progeny produced by the host plant. So if you had a plant producing flowers and fruit, there was an increased proportion of outcrossing that was happening by the host plant. So one speculation is that the presence of this fungus, it's not really causing a disease, but is on all these plants, might actually be leading to greater population diversity in the host plant. So I thought that was pretty cool. And another thing I wondered is if Calamia is toxic to humans and other animals, and it is, it's called deer kill, um, one of its common names, and fungi are closely related to animals, why isn't this toxic to fungi? Why, why can it feed happily on these plants? Well, the calmia toxin is something called a gryanotoxin and gryanotoxins affect sodium channels. And sodium channels are involved in muscle movement, in cognition, in intercell signaling, but fungi don't have sodium channels. They have calcium channels. And there was some work done um, in 2012 where these folks were looking at the origin of ion channels in different organisms, in fungi and animals, quinoflagellata. And you can see down here, the fungi have calcium channels, which makes them distinct from all of these other lineages, which have different sorts of ion channels. So I wonder if that's one of the ways in which fungi overcome things like toxins in plants and are able to successfully live and grow and, and cover all of the mountain laurels that we see. And um, I know Elizabeth said she didn't have fungi in the news. Uh, this was recently in the Washington Post. It was a, an article about Asian lady beetles swarming the mid-Atlantic. And there was not one thing in the entire article about these little yellow bits on the beetle, which is a fungus. That's the entire fungal body. That's a single thallus with the asci and the ascospores inside. And to me, that was the most important part of this story and of this picture. Thanks, Megan. Um, we have a couple minutes before we need to move on to Mitch, if anyone has any questions about the mountain laurel leaf spot. Does this show up on um, the uh, rhododendron, which is similar to the mountain laurel, but not the same? This, this seems to be specific to mountain laurel. A lot of this group, the cercosporoid fungi, are fairly host specific. Um, and this one seems to be specific to calmia. Thank you. If we don't have other questions, I will turn things over to Mitch for a virtual ID table. 